Okay, hello everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to this talk. Um, my name is Richard Mortier. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, unikernels and Docker, uh, from revolution to evolution, as the title says. Um, my background is that I'm uh, faculty at the University of Cambridge in the Systems Research Group. And uh, thanks to acquisition of a startup with which I was involved, uh, I also now work uh, with Docker. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce uh, the notions of unikernels, what unikernels are, where they came from, uh, what we tried to do with them, um, some of the benefits of them. And then I'm going to go through um, some of the ways that we're starting to see unikernels being used in practice uh, and hopefully show a couple of demos that will, uh, that will uh, at least give you a flavor for what, what we think might be, might be possible here. Before I start, and bearing in mind all the lights that are shining in my eyes so I can't see, uh, who here has heard of unikernels? Most people, cool. Uh, who here has used unikernels? Okay, almost nobody. And uh, who here has programmed in OCaml ever, even at school? Okay, a few, a handful. Uh, what about other functional languages like Haskell and uh, things? Oh, more Haskell programmers. That always slightly surprises me. Um, okay, and last question, uh, who has used Docker, yeah, and Docker for Mac or Windows specifically? Lots of people. Okay, cool. So, a starting point, one motivation for this is uh, software today, the process by which we build software. We build software locally, typically, so we develop on some kind of local device, uh, local laptop, server, desktop machine, whatever. Um, but we deploy that software remotely, so we push it out to the cloud in order to actually stick it out there so that other people can use it. Um, and remotely is becoming a slightly odd uh, word to use there, I guess. So some of these devices here on the right are what would normally be referred to as Internet of Things devices. Um, anybody recognize any of them? Yeah, just shout out, I'll repeat it. Yeah, so the scales is pretty, pretty popular. I think that's some kind of Fitbit like device as well. And there are things like this that you use to track various things. You know, if you're into the quantified self movement, for example, you track various data about yourself. Um, there's a Nest thermostat there that's pretty, sort of pretty popular. I don't know if I, I could say common yet. Um, and these are all Internet of Things devices. These are devices that have become smart, they need to run software. Okay? So then it's not just the case that we're selling things now, we're selling things that embed software in them. Um, some of these things are becoming. Uh, I guess the word remote is not appropriate. Uh, intimate might be better. So I think the two things on the bottom right there, you've got an internet-connected pacemaker and an internet-connected insulin pump, I think it is. Uh, so these things, perhaps, you would think twice about putting in your body to connect you to the internet, um, certainly in the light of recent uh, botnet events, Mirai and so on. So we are potentially building ourselves a problem here. We're going to embed smarts, embed software in all of these devices. Um, there's going to be you know, trillions of CPUs, as the slide says, as the, as the phrase goes. And they're going to be embedded everywhere in the environment about us, around us. And all these deployments are going to inherit, inherit the existing system issues that we have. So security and speed are going to be problems. They're going to be running general purpose operating systems, typically things like Linux at the moment. Um, the resource footprint as well is a problem there. These are operating systems that are designed for server class machines, essentially, and they're being carved down and carved down and, and, and stripped down to try and fit them into these, these small devices. They're going to be connected to the network, but often, because of the way that networks now work, because of the way the internet has evolved, uh, they're not actually very well connected to each other. So you often need to go out to some kind of cloud service to come back in to talk to another device on your network. It can be difficult to talk directly among these devices. And then finally, and perhaps most worryingly of all, m many of these things are going to be deployed without any professional management. So it's going to be us, or our families, or relatives, or friends, um, our kids, who are going to be deploying these things. And it's not clear that all of them are going to be fully trained sysadmins. Um, I possibly, in fact, many people will not be fully trained sysadmins before they start deploying this stuff. So they're not going to be uh, kind of ready, able, and understanding how to do firmware upgrades and how to manage a deployment of a set of devices, an ensemble of devices in the home. Um, I don't know, maybe we'll, we'll employ a whole new set of plumbers who will turn up and be able to do firmware upgrades, but maybe not. So these are new devices, it's old software, there's going to be generational bugs, and in particular, a number of these bugs are going to be very, very difficult to find and fix. So even if we find and fix the bug in the software, finding the device to apply the upgrade to 
uh, accessing the device to apply the upgrade to is going to become difficult. Did anybody see, I, I only came across it uh, earlier in the week, uh, there's a paper that's come out about um, hacking uh, Philips Hue light bulbs and being able to remotely exploit a uh, firmware bug to, in, uh, to install your own firmware on those light bulbs once you're within range of them. Uh, the, in the paper, I believe the statement is made that you, once that's done, the device is bricked and you can't replace the firmware, you can't repair the device by upgrading it again. Um, this seems worrying. Uh, this is not a good thing, I think. So, Mirai, right? You, these devices are going to be connected, they're going to be well connected, they're going to be unmanaged, they're going to be difficult to upgrade and fix. So, that's the Internet of Things, that's the sort of terrifying current and future world we're moving to. What has happened in terms of cloud service deployment, on the other hand, uh, has recently been quite productive, I think. At least there seems to be a lot of interest in it. It's gained a lot of ground. So we have, we've moved from the idea that you have a monolithic piece of software that you put out there and it does everything. as one big system. And we've gone through this process of taking that monolith, those monoliths, breaking them up into pieces, <coughs> excuse me, splitting them apart and running so-called microservices architectures. So you take the components in the monolith and you split them up into pieces. And so you end up with a lot of smaller, simpler pieces rather than one big, complex uh, piece of deployment, deployed software. Um, and Docker is one of the technologies that's really made that uh, take off as an approach. It's really made it easy to do that, this notion of being able to build, ship, run software anywhere. And this is the kind of way it, the way it goes about it. right? So you have the Docker engine sitting on top of your OS, and it essentially multiplexes the kernel to a set of containers. And the containers are kind of more than a process, but perhaps less in some sense than a VM. So they've got, they're sharing a, a kernel underneath, uh, but you tend to be deploying them in such a way that you are, you're running a very small number of processes within each container. So each container is very special purpose, very single purpose. You don't have to do it like that, but that's the recommended way that I think that, that these are deployed. There's a sort of problem, though, with these microservices, which is that it's really the tip of the iceberg. No matter how simple the piece of code that you want to run is that's going to consume those APIs, it's got a dependency on this OS. And the OS kernel is a big piece of code. Right? So I don't know exactly how that was counted, but Debian 5 is 65 million lines. The Linux kernel is over 25 million lines of that, whatever a line of code means. Right? It's a substantial component. There's a lot of code involved in the current Linux kernel. So you have this sort of iceberg effect. You've got this tip of code on the top, which is the code that you want to run. That's your actual application that's going to generate you revenue or you know, make you happy or satisfy your friends or whatever it is you're doing it for. And then there's all the code underneath that the operating system is insisting you need. So you need to have a kernel there. You probably need to have glibc. You probably need to have all these other large, complex, well-engineered, and so far reasonably reliable components, but nonetheless, lots of code involved in them. Um, so you have this traditional software stack where you've got lots of components underneath, including a kernel. <coughs> and you're only using, probably, small parts of them. So there's only some pieces of those libraries and some pieces of that kernel that are actually relevant. And your kernel may have a number of file system drivers built into it, but if your application is not exercising those, your application doesn't need those file systems, it's not using that code. It's just sitting there in the kernel. Um, so you've got this, uh, this effect that you have a very, very large complex software stack of which, which is, tends to be sort of always available by default. You're only using small parts of it. And so the claim would be, and I think this is borne out by the sort of continual recurrence of uh, serious exploits and vulnerabilities in a number of these components, that it's more like this kind of Kraken effect, that your code's sitting on top like a little boat on the sea, and at some point there's going to be some kernel bug discovered or some libc or, I don't know, OpenSSH bug, whatever it might be, discovered, which means that people can now get into your system and do bad things to it. Okay, so you have this effect that all this stack that you've been relying upon, simply because of its size, can become a problem. It can become a... It can, contain vulnerabilities that would be a problem. And the claim, I think, would be, at least the claim we would make, is that the sort of the problem here, the underlying problem here is the complexity. It's just the size. It's the so many pieces of code means that you have such a complex configuration for how you configure. And if you configure a full Linux install now, there's lots of things you can, you know, I don't know how many options there are now in a kernel build, but there's lots of them. I know that much. Um, and there's lots of configuration files that you will have in, on a running system, you know, ls in slash etsy, for example, there's lots of stuff in there, there's lots of things running, lots of different ways of configuring all these, all these programs. Um, so it's complex, it's complex to get right. 
<coughs> there are also cases where duplication of the functionality will lead to inefficiency. So um, you have lots of different layers of multiplexing, for example. You might have some kind of green threads, use level threads library. You might have, uh, I don't know, a JVM, some other kind of virtual machine runtime environment, which provides a threading notion as well. That's possibly multiplexed on top of, um, inside your container. It's going to be multiplexed onto the kernel. There's kernel threads involved. Maybe that's running inside a virtual machine if it's out there on Amazon, for example. Um, so you've then got Zen doing some kind of scheduling. So there's lots of layers of scheduling involved there in that case. So you're getting sort of lots of potentially inefficiencies due to this kind of multiplexing effect. Um, many of the images that are being used to support these kind of deployments are quite large in comparison to the, the actual piece of code that you wish to run. Um, so you look at a standard Ubuntu image or a standard Debian image, for example, um, and they can be substantial, uh, tens of megabytes, hundreds of megabytes, even gigabytes. And so it takes a little while to boot them. It takes a little while for them to come up. It takes a little while to deploy them. And then finally, this point I've made already, that we've got more lines of code, and it just means a larger attack surface. Even if they're reasonably well-engineered and well-trusted lines of code that have been there for a long time, people still find bugs in them. Um, as one of the profs in Cambridge describes, uh, we still build code using uh, 1960s technology. Uh, he would like to see us move to 1970s technology, which is to say ML instead of C. Um, but the, you know, there's still there's, there's old code sits around, and it's sort of got latent bugs in it. So overall, this kind of complexity in these systems is a problem. <coughs> and this was the, you know, I guess you'd say, rev well, some people would say revolution. Um, what goes around comes around. A lot of the technology in this is built on um, ideas from the 1990s. So uh, this idea of unikernels. So the unikernel is the idea that you're going to take your application and compile it and link it into a specialized operating system that includes only the functionality necessary to run your code on the target platform. So you no longer have a general purpose OS that sits underneath. But you try and minimize that as much as you can. You take your application code, and in, in the compiler tool chain and the linker tool chain, you pick and choose the bits of system functionality you need, and those get linked into your application, and you end up with some kind of binary image that you can run, that essentially you can boot. Um, so in the first instance of this that we built, uh, this would take a, an OCaml program and turn it into either a POSIX binary, an ELF binary that you could just run on OS X or Linux, or it would turn it into a Zen virtual machine image that you could run with Excel, create, uh, VM config, whatever it was. Okay, so you, you're trying to pick and choose among the bits of system functionality you need and link just exactly those into your, into, against your code so that you end up with this very minimal image that comes out at the end. So it's application code being added to operating system libraries producing this standalone unikernel. And there's a Wikipedia entry now, so it must be legitimate. Um, we have taken a number of inspirations here uh, when we did this work, in particular the library operating system work for those who are familiar with it. Has anybody ever read anything about or heard about Exakernel? One or two. Scout? Is that? So these were Nemesis, even? That was the Cambridge one. So these were uh, library operating systems that came out in the, I guess, the middle, mid to late 1990s. So the idea was that you convert your operating system kernel instead of having it running as a shared service. Instead of doing the microkernel micro thing and splitting it up into a number of uh, concurrently running services, which provide shared services, just smaller ones, you take your, your shared service kernel and you convert it into a set of libraries. And then you link those libraries against your application and allows you to do things like accounting resource consumption to applications much more precisely, because you no longer have to account it to the kernel. You would get to account it to the application it was, those services were linked against. Anyway, unikernels, take application code, link it against the libraries you need, and then you end up with this, this self-contained image. It's not an intent of ours, when we develop unikernels, to reinvent the general purpose OS. So we were not trying to remake Windows or Linux. It is this notion of just providing enough, just enough system software to run the code you want to run. So it's specialization all the way down. You can sort of iteratively specialize the, these things. Um, the application developer should be in control of this process. Um, it's quite well aligned with the DevOps approach. So you sort of, the, the developer is in charge of the process as it kind of trickles down and you get towards the thing that you're going to deploy in the end. Um, and in, I think, all the ones that I'm aware of anyway, certainly the Mirage uh, unikernel system with which I'm most familiar, um, it's open source libraries. So it's taking, taking system functionality, implementing it as a small service-specific library, 
um, and then releasing that as an open source thing under some liberal license, typically ISC for us. Because it's very important here that these system pieces of system functionality are widely used and get to be widely tested. You only want to have one of them. You don't want to have everybody implementing their own file system, everybody implementing their own network stack. Okay, these are, these are complex things to get right, so put them out there, make it easy to share them. So I've mentioned a few times Mirage. Has anybody heard of Mirage, apart from me just mentioning it now? Uh, one or two. Okay. <coughs> so there's lots of others. Um, Mirage is the one I'm most familiar with. Um, it's a unikernel framework built in NoCaml. Um, most of the unikernel frameworks tend to be lang language specific. So you look at something like HalVM is the Haskell one. Uh, Ling is uh, built in Erlang. Include OS is a C++ one. Um, Mirage has been self-hosted. The website has been self-hosted at mirage.io since 2009. That used to be openmirage.org, but it was still the self-hosted website. So this is a unikernel web server that contains all the content that's being served at that website. Hopefully it's up as I speak about this. Um, <coughs> the, those components that are used to create that unikernel are now distributed as lots and lots of small libraries. So they're not all in that particular unikernel, but there are now over 100 libraries that we've got that implement different bits of functionality. There's several from scratch protocol implementations. So we've done our own TCP stack, uh, we've done our own um, key value stores, DHCP, uh, lots of these things. Um, I'll talk a little bit about one of them in particular, which is the TLS stack. So we have a, a clean room imp implementation of TLS. Among the benefits are that you have reduced attack surface and reduced resource use, <coughs> excuse me, and more predictable scheduling. Another benefit of this is that you get to relatively easily retarget your code for different platforms, because all you have to do is re-implement the lower layer libraries that you're depending upon. Um, so the initial versions of Mirage would target ELF binaries running on Linux or OS X, or Zen virtual machine images. But we've had various people do work. For example, uh, we've contributed somewhat to the Zen port to ARM, so that uh, in particular the Minios port to ARM. So you can now target Zen on ARM as well as Zen on x86 with Mirage unikernels. Um, we did some work to uh, get a prototype of a kernel module ABI. So by linking into this particular kernel module, you could essentially insert your application code into the kernel of the system you're running on. Um, so you can target quite, a, quite an odd platform there. Perhaps the uh, strangest one of these is the target for JavaScript. So thanks to the OCaml to JavaScript compiler, uh, we could take a unikernel, um, again, by linking in, including various libraries that were necessary, you can take your unikernel and compile it to run in the browser if you want to do that. Um, we don't really have an application for that yet, but it seemed like an interesting thing to do. Some quick numbers. These are from a somewhat older version of Mirage, but I don't think uh, they're, they're unrepresentative. So if you look at the top left plot, the memory size uh, of the uh, running image uh, is, can, can be made a lot smaller using Mirage there than, than even using quite an optimized Linux, uh, power virtualized uh, VM there. Uh, if you look on the right-hand side, we had a uh, DNS server. These were sizes of the uh, on-disk image that was going to be booted. Um, and if you did, if you used the bytecode compiler and did dead code elimination, you could get these down to hundreds of kilobytes for DNS server, web server, and so on. So you, can, you could really optimize some of these things. One of the nice things here is that we can take advantage of all the work that's going into the OCaml language itself uh, with some very smart people working on that. And so when they come out with some new optimization, you just rebuild the unikernel and deploy it, and usually it gets better in some way, smaller, faster, whatever. Um, one of the interesting ones was we did a DNS server where we managed to, with the first implementation of our DNS server, we were only twice as bad as bind. Uh, is that bind? Sorry, twice as bad as NSD. Um, so that wasn't great. But then again, taking advantage of the fact that this is a high-level language, it was about six or seven lines of code to add memoization into the DNS server, and that brought us down to be, that improved the throughput, I should say. Um, so higher is better on that plot, on the middle plot on the right, um, higher is better. So that allowed us to do better than NSD and considerably better than bind. <coughs> uh, if you want more information about any of these results, they've been published in academic papers. There's a paper in uh, ACM ASPLOS 2013 that describes the initial Mirage system, and there's a paper in uh, Usenix NSDI network system design implementation in 2015, which describes some of the later work we did to make it uh, much easier to boot unikernels very quickly. Uh, a system called Jitsu, just-in-time summoning of unikernels. I said I'd mention uh, the TLS stack. So we rebuilt the TLS stack, we built a new TLS stack. 
Um, and we tried to test this in some sense by putting up what was called the Bitcoin pinata. So the TLS stack was a new stack written on a camel from scratch, specifically for use with unikernels. It's about six months of code by two guys, uh, Hannes and David, Hannes uh, Menart and David Caliber. The code size is less than about 10,000 lines, so that compares favorably with most existing implementations of TLS. Uh, almost all the protocol is written in safe code, so it's almost all written in our camel. There are a couple of bits of C because you, you, otherwise you end up with a side channel through the garbage collector where people can attack uh, at the encryption as it goes on. Um, it's not vulnerable, therefore, to heartbleed style bugs. In an attempt to test this, rather than simply assert it, although it's, it's not a, an exhaustive test, uh, we built a unikernel uh, that served up a little web page which explained that it had embedded in that unikernel a wallet that contained 10 bitcoins. Um, and if anybody was able to break it, they could steal that, that wallet identifier and take the bitcoins. Uh, this was up for well over six months. Uh, there were certainly over 100,000 attacks on it. Um, nobody took the bitcoins. Uh, some people donated some bitcoins, which was nice, uh, but nobody took any. Uh, we suspect this was people testing if it was a real wallet. <coughs> if you think about what was happening there, imagine trying to do that with a Linux kernel module that you embed some bitcoins in a kernel module, or you embed some bitcoins in Apache and say to people, come and break this and you can take this. Um, it seems like this would be, again, this is not proving anything, but it seems like it would be more likely that somebody might be able to do that. There are more avenues to attack that. Um, 100,000 attacks on this and it seemed to do okay. So, I've talked a bit about unikernels technology. Did that make sense to everybody? Everybody get the point of unikernels? Yeah, some people are nodding. Some people are not moving at all. Um, it's late. Um, so, what I'll do now is I'll talk a little bit about where we're starting to see unikernels actually being used in practice. Certainly coming into, if not in very wide-scale deployments yet, they're certainly starting to appear in products. <coughs> so, uh, at the top left is a story. If you go to unikernel.org, by the way, this is a site that's trying to build a community around the unikernel approach. So there's listed and linked there about 10, maybe 12 now, different unikernel projects. Um, and there's stories appearing there of when people are starting to use them in practice. Um, so the top left is actually a prototype implementation. So this is from Ericsson, where they've used Mirage OS unikernels to build a system that allows them to implement network function virtualization on one of their platforms. So the idea is that when a packet hits the switch, uh, a unikernel picks up that packet, examines it, and then instantiates the protocol unikernel that's necessary to service that request. And then once that request is serviced, once that, that packet stream has been dealt with, those unikernels can be killed. Um, there was a, a very early example of this in a, in a non-NFV uh, situation um, by uh, Magnus Gestad when, as part of the Jitsu work, where we had a website where every URL uh, triggered the booting of a unikernel that served that page, and only that page. Um, and you could browse the website and unicorns would be popping up as you browsed and being destroyed afterwards. Um, similar thing here, but for something a, a bit more useful, namely processing uh, streams of packets, flows of packets. The bottom left one, Cyberchaff, this is from uh, Galois. So uh, they have products that involve using HalVM unikernels to um, provide essentially many, many uh, fake targets inside a network. So if somebody's in, managed to get inside your network and they're starting to port scan to see what to go to next, what to attack next, they get distracted by having lots and lots and lots of these little lightweight unikernels that are sort of thrown up as chaff to slow them down and give them uh, sort of meaningless targets to go and hit. The one I'll talk about uh, most, I guess, because I'm most familiar with it, is the Docker for Mac and Windows, uh, which I believe is now on general release rather than in beta. Um, so these are ways to use Docker on, on your laptop. So there's unikernel technology embedded inside these. Some of the libraries that we use in those products are from the unikernel world. So the question was really how to run, I mean, the question this, these products are trying to solve, this is the sort of evolution phase, I guess. So rather than thinking we have to throw everything away and start again, we want to start taking these technologies and slowly fitting them into existing uses, existing deployments, solving existing problems with them. So how can we run Linux containers seamlessly on OS X and Windows? To date, that's been, you know, well, to date, till about six months ago, that's been VirtualBox and a Linux virtual machine. So for Do with Docker for Mac and Windows, we can make that a much more seamless transition, much more seamless usage of Docker, um, because we can translate uh, operating system invocations on both sides between the container and the host, essentially. 
So you end up with Windows and Mac applications that just run Docker containers. <coughs> For those who've not seen, there will be a short delay while I can't use Keynote. Uh, for those who've not seen this, um, by way of example, uh, this is invoking Docker to build my blog, my website locally as a Jekyll site. So you can see doc the Docker run command here, uh, which is sort of running Jekyll to instantiate, to create the, bl create the blog, build the blog, and then serve it. And then hopefully, uh, localhost 8080 which you probably can't read, but localhost eight, uh, port 8080 on this device is now serving out that site. Um, that's not really that impressive. Um, well, who knows if this is that impressive, but still. Um, if I move a new post into there, into the directory that's being built, um, then you can see the regeneration of the site occurs. And so there's now a demo post uh, up there. If I... Uh, bore you all by typing. If I put something here, I can uh, write that, and again, regeneration occurs, and that goes there. So that's all the iNotify sort of working correctly between the container and the local host file system, which was useful. Um, so quick demo of Docker for Mac. Similar things on Windows. What's going on there? How are unicorns being used? So uh, the virtualization that's being used is using HyperKit, so the, the OSS Hyper, OSX HyperKit framework, based on XHive, which is based on FreeBSD's Beehive. It's sandbox friendly, so most of the processes are running as local non-root users. Um, there's an embedded lightweight Al based on Alpine Linux distribution. It's optimized for fast boot. And it allows us to provide a self-contained Docker app. So you can do drag and drop install. Um, the, it needs to have I think sudo permissions only to install symlinks uh, so that you can have the Docker command line tools uh, being served out of the Docker app. Um, and it means you get auto updates and all these other good things. So this is the kind of, this sort of, oh, I don't get a mouse pointer. Okay. Uh, down at the bottom, you can see the kind of hypervisor framework is uh, mediating between the OSX host and the Linux host. Then inside the Linux host, there's a bunch of containers. And then there are some drivers that, that manage uh, IO through that. Uh, through that sequence. A couple of them are sort of specifically were, were somewhat interesting. So for networking, we had a problem that we had to deal with custom VPN software on the host that made it difficult to get the bridge to work because the VPN would take over the bridge and then we didn't get to use it. So we produced a thing called VPN Kit, which uses some of the Mirage networking libraries um, to essentially do reconstruction based on the Ethernet frames that are flowing out of the container into socket calls on the OSX host. Uh, so we're sort of doing a reverse, um, reverse proxy or something, I guess you'd call it. So we've got packets flowing through. We want to pick those packets up, turn them back into the socket calls that they would have generated them, and then feed them out through the OSX host. And that means that we play nice with the VPN now, because we're just more socket calls as far as it's concerned. Um, we also need to be able to publish ports uh, properly. And we'd like those to be exposed on localhost without needing to go and work out what the VM's IP address is, allocated to its interface, and all that kind of stuff that you'd have to do traditionally. Um, so again, we can forward the container port requests to an OSX service, which then bind them properly on the native interface. So we've got control of the I.O. that's flowing in and out of, or flowing between the container, the, the Linux host, and the, the local OSX host. <coughs> File systems. So as I showed in that little demo, uh, we want to transparently share arbitrary OSX directories into the container. Um, so we use a fuse forwarding layer, and again, we can translate the Linux file system calls into the OSX equivalents. So we can map quite easily between the two worlds, between the Linux world sitting inside the, the VM and the, the OSX host. Similarly for iNotify. So we can have something that observes in the host when iNotify is being invoked and can pass that into the, into the Linux host, which can pass that there and expose that there in the standard way to the container. Um, so we can have iNotify flowing correctly through these, this sequence. OK, I'm going to run somewhat under, I think. Um, so that's a use in a sort of a non-standard way, I guess you'd say. So this is not unikernels being deployed as unikernels. This is unikernel technology being taken and embedded inside products. Um, one of the things I'm involved with in the computer lab in Cambridge, in the computer science department, 
um, is uh, a thing called OCaml Labs. So this is an organization that's attempting to uh, improve the state of the art in terms of the tooling, particularly the platform that OCaml provides as a language. And um, so we have a blog. This is a wiki, a standard kind of media wiki site. Uh, it runs as four containers hosted on the Docker Cloud. So we have a MySQL container, we have a media wiki container, which is PHP and Apache. Um, we have a TLS tunnel uh, to give us a TLS endpoint, so we don't have to trust the container that's got media wiki and Apache in it. Uh, and we have an HTTP to HTTPS redirector. Um, the redirector is a Mirage unikernel. <coughs> so this is a unikernel that's been built. It's a few tens, I guess, of lines of code uh, that is able to listen on the appropriate port, on port 80, um, receive connections, and send the redirect to port 443 so that it's getting redirected to TLS. Um, I'm in the process of turning the TLS tunnel into something similar so that then that can receive, that can be the TLS endpoint, can receive the request from the redirector, and then can pass the the um, the request through into the containers that are running Apache and MediaWiki and MySQL. Um, this gives us some benefits. So the small piece of code here that runs the redirector doesn't have any other things running inside it. There is no shell to attack. There is no uh, libc. There is no Linux kernel. It's just that piece of code which is necessary to redirect uh, HTTP requests to HTTPS requests. Similar thing will happen with the TLS tunnel. It'll be just that piece of code which is necessary to listen on the um, HTTPS socket and be able to forward requests through onto something out of its back end into the traditional containers, receive the results from that, and forward them back out. There will be nothing else in there, and it'll be running the OCaml TLS stack, so we hope it'll be less vulnerable to uh, attack. Um, in terms of how this happens, this is currently a bit of a hack, I have to admit, uh, but it does work. So we have, if I could type, a build script which does some stuff. Uh, basically, we're, what we're doing here is we're pu pulling a base container, we're linking some code, we're using that base container to build another container image, which will contain the unikernel and nothing else. Um, there were some invocations of Docker and all sorts of stuff going on there. Um, you can look at this uh, repository, if I could remember the name of it. Uh, if, you, if you're interested, ask me afterwards and I'll tell you the name of it, or indeed... What is it? There we go. Uh, that's, that's where the, the repo lives. So that, that dot build, I'll run it again for good luck, um, that dot build command built a container image. Well, it will do when it finishes. There we go. And if I then run that container, it also built the run script, helpfully. If I then run that container, I can issue a curl to the local host on the standard HTTP port, and I get back the re redirect from that. So this is, a, this is the, the piece of code that's doing the outcome of the piece of code that's doing that. And if I look in source, there's a bunch of stuff there which is not important. This is the configuration. So it's not very long. It's mostly only because it provides a few command line keys. This is for handling the command line keys, all this code. And then down here is the actual configuration that goes on. So this is saying the unikernel is something that's going to invoke a particular module in a camel speak. That module is going to need to be provided with a clock and an HTTP server. Uh, we also, when we start the thing off down here, we need to provide it with an HTTP server there, which is constructed from a network stack, which is a generic IPv4 network stack that has TCP available to it. Uh, it's not terribly interesting. Uh, what's the other thing called? Redirector. So this is the actual code that's doing the redirect. So there you go. It's just over a screenful there. Um, so we've got something that does redirection. We've got something that acts as a server. And then we've got an entry point which actually uh, kicks things off. So it invokes the server and tells it to serve using the redirect function. Um, I'm not going to bother trying to explain our camel syntax. For those of you who know it, hopefully that is not too offensively bad as code goes. And for those who don't know it, at least you can see it's short. Um, if you've got questions about that, again, ask me afterwards. So we can make it, hopefully, simple to build unikernel containers. There's a lot of other infrastructure that would be nice to have around that, so it would be good to be able to uh, tag these differently and be able to use them and be able to reconfigure them perhaps uh, as part of the build process. So a bit more control over that would be good. Um, but that at least serves as a, as a quick working example of the sorts of things that might be possible to do with them. 
And it sort of serves as an example of the way that Docker is moving into all these different architectures. So it's no longer just Linux containers on x86. Um, you can have different um, uh, arch CPU architectures being supported, x86, ARM, Power, etc., and different operating systems. Uh, the Windows container support has been announced recently, Windows Hyper-V containers, and there's works in progress to build, bring other things into this fold. So the idea will be that you can cover all of this space using a single tool chain. By way of... Has anybody tried the uh, multi-arch support in Docker for Mac? No? Anybody? It's quite neat, I suppose. So um, if I run this particular... Mm, that's not going to be very helpful. If I run this particular image, then you name will report that it's running on an arm, even though it's actually running on here. Um, so that's invoking using bin format misc and QMU in the background to make things look like an arm, in this case. Uh, if I could remember the container image, then I'd be able to do that for PowerPC as well, but I can't remember it off the top of my head. Um, but it's sort of a, a seamless way of being able to do development, ARM development, for example, using an x86 laptop. You don't have to set up cross-compilation and such things in the same way as you might do currently to do that, to make that work, which is nice. So this is, I guess, this is the conclusion. Um, so this is what we're heading towards, hopefully. Uh, building, shipping, running software without really needing to care too much about where it comes from. So Linux containers, Windows containers are already supported. Um, soon, we hope to get Unikernel supported as well. And the containers there, the things that are being managed, are the things in the sort of chalky red outlines. So traditional Linux containers, you've got applications running in containers that will share a kernel, um, often sitting on top of a hypervisor because that's the way the cloud works. Um, Windows containers, similar thing, but with Windows and then a hypervisor. But now, hopefully, with unikernels, we can bind the OS more tightly against the application and simplify that picture further and have things using just the resource they need and not having to use all this other stuff that they're never going to, they never actually invoke. And this is all turning into just containers as this service platform. Uh, for those who would like to hack on some of these components, we open source some of them at OSCon this year. So HyperKit, VPN Kit, and Data Kit. Uh, which are used in the Docker for Mac and Windows products, are also now available for people to take and use and build upon themselves. If you go to the Docker GitHub uh, organization, they're listed there as repositories. And with that, I'd like to say thank you and ask if there are any questions, if I can see anything. Yeah. Okay, I've got, I think, one over there on the left. Uh, that's what Docker for Windows allows you to do, yeah. Um, if I hadn't broken the Fusion virtual machine I've got on here, I'd be able to show you that by running Docker for Windows inside VM, uh, VM Fusion on, site in, on this. And would it also be possible for Windows-based containers to run on Linux? Uh, in the end, I think that should be possible. That's not something we support right now. Okay. One there. So the question is, what's the link? Uh, sorry for not repeating the, the first question. Uh, the question is, what's the link between this, the things I've shown, essentially the unicorns I've shown, and the small devices? So I think there's kind of two. Uh, there may be more in the future. Uh, the future is hard to predict, it turns out. Um, the, uh, the first one is that thanks to the multi-arch support, uh, it's possible to set up uh, build processes and build pipelines for doing IoT device development using a slightly richer environment like this, because I can make this pretend to be an ARM, and I don't have to l learn about cross-compilation. So we hope that that support might, be, might make it easier for people who want to build those images to start with. And secondly, yes, we would like it to be the case that we can start to compile unikernel images to run on those devices. Um, we've done that so far in terms of uh, devices that have enough capability to support Zen, because we can just target Zen for ARM. So I have an EU project, for example, where we've done that fairly extensively to uh, build um, Mirage unikernels that will run on Cubiboard 2s and Cubitrucks, because they have the necessary hardware to, to run Zen easily. Um, we had a prototype in the lab where somebody had ported the OCaml runtime to boot directly on a Raspberry Pi, which unfortunately doesn't have the necessary hardware to run Zen. So that would be, a, I think, a small matter of code 
to extend that sufficiently so that Mirage could then target that. And so you could have a single image then running on your Raspberry Pi, which was a Mirage unikernel. Um, but all of the, those things, are, that thing is uh, still a prototype. So it's not something that, that's, uh, that's straightforward to try yet. Try yet. Um, but certainly targeting Zen on ARM is, is easy, as easy as any other uh, Mirage target. Other, OK. Uh, so the question is, is it not contradictory? Is there not some um, sort of mutual conflict, if you like, between the approaches taken with Docker and Docker containers and unikernels? So I would say no. I would say that unikernels are on a spectrum that, that traditional Linux containers are at one end of, and Docker is trying to make it easy to build and run all of the things on that spectrum. So it might have started with Linux containers, but now it's supporting all these other things as well. Um, unikernels kind of take what you might think of as a container approach, where you build a container, you have a Docker file that specifies what's in it, and sort of just try and push that a few steps further so that you're now invoking your language-specific compilers and linkers in order to build the output image. So you can maybe leverage some of what those tools can do to get smarter about what goes into that image and, be, and sort of strip it down even more. But it's not fundamentally opposed to the notion of having containers. The idea of showing that OCaml Labs media wiki site was to try and say you can take an existing deployment of containers and you can start to insert unikernels where it makes sense with that. You don't have to throw everything away and start again. You can sort of you can add them into existing deployments potentially. Does that answer the question? Maybe. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, sorry. Uh, so into uh, any of the unikernels I've built, you can't, because I didn't build SSH into them. So there is no SSH support. We do have an OCaml SSH implementation, although it's quite old now and has a bit rotted. Um, if that was brought up to date, it would be possible to, uh, I think that might even be one of the pioneer projects we've got on the Mirage Wiki, um, it would be possible to build, to compile that library into your unikernel, and then you'd have SSH support. Um, but right now, no. Any further questions? Okay, in that case, let me done. Thank you very much. <laughs>